Good evening. Welcome to this evening's edition of the Evening Review Show. My name is Jemima Birkus, your host. Now, um, the first media, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, is having its region, Africa Regional Conference on Information, Communication Rights in Africa. And during this conference, they will tackle with international organ um, organizations, representations, and um, international actors as well. They'll be tackling a, a range of issues facing um, legal and political practices, shaping information, and communication rights and participat uh, participatory democracy in Namibia. So just to tell us about this conference and what, what they will discuss and uh, the purpose of it, we have in studio Freya Grunhagen. Uh, she's the resident uh, director of FES Namibia country office and its media organization, FES Media. Thank you for joining us, Freya. Thank you so much for having me here, Jemima. So um, uh, Freya, can you tell us um, about this conference, when is it taking place, and uh, who are the notable guests that will be there? Oh, of course. Um, so the conference is coming up on the 31st of May. It will be a three days conference in Windhoek, Namibia. And we are expecting approximately 50 guests from the region, all of them experts, um, human rights advocates, stakeholders, media practitioners, actually from 16 countries, which is a lot plus approximately 25 participants from Namibia. Mm -hmm. Additionally, everyone is invited to join us virtually. We are having a live stream going on and it will be shown via all our social media platforms, easily accessible and comments and um, any questions will be taken up. Okay. So uh, now, um, how does access to a public information contribute to democracy and good governance in Africa? Oof, there are so, so many ways how this is interlinked. Um, well, st let me start uh, with participation. Yes. Democracy is about engaged citizens. It's about the right of each and every citizen to participate fully in its society, polit politics and economy. But then again, of course, you can only participate if you're informed. Yes. You need information. Otherwise, there is no meaningful, part there can, could be participation, but no meaningful political participation. So this is just one aspect. Another one is that when it comes to human rights, you have to know what you're entitled to. If you don't know, how can you claim it? <laughs> how can you demand it? Um, so you have to know what you're entitled to in order to um, stand up for your rights and also just um, really purchase, not purchase them, chase them, and make, make sure that you access them. Mm -hmm. Access to public goods is directly linked to access to information. And then, of course, um, the critical role of the media as being the watchdog or the fourth force. Um, and you, you need transparency. I mean, we've just seen the fish rod book coming up and all these discussions, corruption, nepotism, whatsoever. We're having all these discussions um, about um, in, in the mineral sector. Um, if you don't have access to the crucial information, there's nothing you can do about it. So that's the crucial role of the media. So what role does uh, Frederick Ebert Stiftung play to make sure that people at the grassroots level get, the, uh, get educated when it comes to um, accessing their, uh, their rights? Well, we as FIS Media and also as FES, what we try to do is to provide platforms for our debate. Um, that's what we do in the very, very first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, we invite for public discussions. We invite, of course, experts to come on board. Um, this is a expert conference, that's a different approach. Yes, of course. But then uh, we also developed online courses, mm -hmm. which actually are targeted um, at civil society and journalists on the one place, but also government officials on, on the other. There are two separate courses um, where you can get training on access to information and how it relates to you and how you can demand for it effectively. Um, it will be, the next courses will probably be running at the end of the year. Um, so everyone is entitled and invited um, to, to okay. partake in them. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the topics um, of this conference will be the laws, especially during elections. So can you talk to us about uh, the current status of uh, enacting laws on access to public information in um, African countries? I think in terms of legal frameworks, uh, African countries have made great strides during the last 10, 20 years. Um, it's, it, I mean, it's 26 countries um, out of 54 that are already having ATR laws in place. This is a success story, I would think. Although, of course, still another 28 are missing. Um, 
But having one law is one thing, um, operationalizing them, implementing them is another one. And this is as important it is, as it is to come up with reasonable and really profound legal frameworks, um, it's much even more demanding to come up uh, with ideas on how to implement them. It's very costly. And then, of course, it also requires a lot of um, really stuff to implement that. Yes. And this stuff has to be trained. You need information officers. Um, so I would like to commend the Namibian government that um, they put aside a budget of 20 million for this first phase of operationalizing the law in Namibia. Um, I'm afraid much more will be needed, but we'll see that to that later. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, you've just talked about the implementation and uh, the challenges that comes with uh, some of these laws have not been implemented. And uh, like Namibia, for instance, uh, it has not been operationalized. It has only been signed into law. What are the challenges that comes with a situation like this, especially going into election uh, um, a period that uh, kicks off next year? And even in Zimbabwe, that's gonna go into election next mm -hmm. year when, when there are no definite laws in place that that, uh, um, uh, that uh, guarantee the right of access to information? I think there is a clear difference between Zimbabwe and Namibia. Yeah. <laughs> Namibia having been the beacon of uh, press freedom yes, of for course. many, many years here in Africa. So I think even, uh, even without this law, Namibia has been doing well during times of elections. Um, so I th think we don't have to fear that much. It's, and we don't have to be too preoccupied, of course, um, the, the, the earlier the better in any case, but then again, implementation takes time and we shouldn't be too impatient. I'm, you know, I'm not too worried and preoccupied about that, but um, we have seen in many, many instances in Africa during the past couple of years, um, how actually internet shutdowns have been uh, operationalized or implemented or put in place uh, during times of elections. And this, well, and you know, I don't want to predict anything, but that certainly is a huge risk and danger whenever an election comes up and access to information is not in place as an operationalized right. Speaking about shutdowns, internet shutdowns, Namibia is registering SIM cards right now and there's been mm -hmm. an outcry that it may impede on the right of journalists um, and their work. As an organization, what are your views about this? Oof, that's a tricky one. <laughs> Well, I do know, of course, about, um, at least uh, according to what I read, uh, why Namibia is doing that. And um, I think there's always, it's a difficult balance to strike between, on the one hand, preventing crime, because I think this is what it's meant to do. Um, and then on the other hand, data privacy. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, one has to walk that balance very, very carefully, I would think, and definitely um, monitor that very closely. I think actually this will be up to media in uh, Namibia to monitor that closely and critically. Mm -hmm. uh, what will be the effects? Um, I don't want to predict anything, forecast anything, um, but definitely private uh, data, privacy, um, security, is a huge issue and, and, and really an asset that needs to be safeguarded. Yes. Freya, you've just uh, mentioned um, uh, financial resources and obviously time as some mm. of the challenges uh, that countries are faced with when it comes to implementing a comprehensive access to information laws. Are there some others? Can you share with us some other uh, re um, challenges uh, given that you have been working with these countries, uh, some of these countries that have enacted these laws? Yeah, I think um, the hugest issue is that you need a lot of training and you need endurance. It's not a once-off training thing and then everyone knows what it is about. Even It's the same with citizens' um, education. It's, it's an ongoing effort. Um, for example, we did uh, a training in Tanzania of the judiciary. That's great, you do it for 14 days and they are well trained and whatever. But then this is just a group of, pe of people. Um, but it's not the whole country. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, access, to um, access, access to information applies to all different levels of governance. Mm -hmm. It's local authorities, it's regional authorities, and also ministry, of course. And to really see to it that all of them have put measures in place to provide the information that citizens might ask for, ah, this is really, it's a huge, huge uh, task, but it's very, very worthwhile um, going into that. Yes, of course. 
Um, so, um, how has the spread of mis and disinformation impacted the exercise of public power and public programs in Africa? Mm. Again, a very crucial issue. Um, well, you see, at the beginning, everyone was excited about digitization and its impact on democracy be because we thought this is going to be the democratization of media, citizen journalism, and look at Arab Spring. Um, you can organize protests more easily. Uh, you can easily share information whatsoever. And of course, not all the information shared was critically assessed before because it was being shared. So even involuntarily, there is a mis- and disinformation problem in place the moment you have social media. But of course, social media can easily be hijacked by non-democratic forces. And we have seen that, I mean, <laughs> on numerous yes. accounts. Um, and you could even, even see how some governments um, took advantage of the COVID pandemic in this regard. Because, uh, yes, obviously, um, disinformation, misinformation on COVID was risky, was dangerous. It was life-threatening. Yes. And you had to safeguard um, health. Is, yes, I understand that from the government perspective. But there were some governments in the region who made use of that um, to put in place kind of mis- and disinformation um, laws that were, were stifling uh, freedom to freedom of expression in a very dramatic way and like ongoing, mm -hmm. not only f during the COVID pandemic. So the whole thing with digitization of media is it comes with opportunities, but unfortunately mm -hmm. with many more risks. And to strike a balance, oof, this is the this is really diligent work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We will mm. go for a short break and then we'll be back on this uh, topic. See you in five minutes. Another exciting episode of Iran World Talk. We will at least be here and tell you what we are doing first. Your monthly campaign. Hello and welcome to today's sports rep show. I am your host, Jesse Jackson. Kau raita. Play Namibia, who had won the toss for the first time on this tour. Good day, everyone. Time for international sports news. Starting off with tennis news, both on the WTA for women's and. Welcome to my dot NA Cars, your ultimate destination for everything automotive. I am your host, Diana Mosta. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Discover the latest models, innovative technologies, and expert insights from our passionate hosts. Learn essential maintenance tips and get exclusive behind the scenes access to the automotive industry. Don't miss my dot NA cars on NTV every Thursday at 2100 hours. Tune in and ignite your passion for automobiles. We are so excited to be kickstarting your morning with the entertainment. Everything was happening mm. during this past weekend. Yes. Exciting news. Wow, no, she was killing it already. In my opinion, I don't see anything wrong with him serving the full term. As well as keeping you informed on the issues that you need to know happening in and around our country. Welcome back, my name is Jemima Birkes, your host for this evening's uh, review edition. Now, if you've just joined us, we are speaking to Freya Grunhald, and she's the resident director of Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Namibia uh, Country Office, as well as their media organization, FES Media. She's talking to us about the uh, next week's uh, regional conference on information communication rights in Africa. Now, uh, before we went on a break, uh, Freya, we talked about um, disinformation uh, and uh, how tedious a job it is to, to, uh, to handle it. Um, can we talk about how um, um, 
the ways in how African governments have justified restrictive measures against journalists and media publishers, uh, publishers based on concerns of mis- and disinformation. You've just touched on it earlier. Yes. As I said, um, misinformation and disinformation is a problem that comes on its own the moment you have social media. And it's always a question of, for any government, how to reg regulate that. There is obviously no self-regulation in place. And we know about the discussions on Twitter and, and also Facebook uh, that self-regulation is just not working. Um, so you have to put in some kind of measures to prevent like hate speech. How do you do that? It's not easy. Again, there, there could be um, like uh, some kind of legal framework that tries to prevent hate, hate speech or to counteract it. But then at the same time, you can make use of that, the, the very same framework, and then just identify maybe a critical comment as um, stirring unrest or you know, expressing hatred against a particular group. It's always a matter of um, interpretation, of course. How do you interpret that particular um, voice? So it can be quickly misused. And this is really um, the challenge that has come with digitization. Um, it's, it has never been as easy as it is now for governments to control its citizens because of social media or the digitization of media. So a few years ago, I remember uh, some countries would, uh, th there were ways um, to, to hide your uh, location. I, I don't quite have the, the name yet, uh, just now. Um, when, when you are uh, tweeting, uh, fa uh, accessing Facebook from a country that, I that has shut down internet, mm. can you talk to us about uh, ways and means? Are, uh, are journalists able to do this? Do you think that journalists need to be capacitated to, to, uh, to access these kind of tools to make sure they can still communicate with the outside world if they are to be hit with a shut, uh, down, internet shutdown? I think it's completely inconceivable for journalists to work without social media. So whatever is available, I'm not really an expert on these tools, to be mm -hmm. honest. I really, there's very little I can contribute to that. But um, as much as the analog media is still necessary, definitely, and, and we, I really, I think we have to work and strive for media sustainability, um, like in a, with a very broad view, including print media, for example. So. But, but social media has to be uh, enabled somehow, um, and especially access to internet. Mm -hmm. Ex um, internet universality is, I think, at the core of access to information in Africa. And we have to look into which means will be available, made available, to ensure that. Um, you've said there's, there's going to be d uh, delegates and uh, activists from uh, a number of countries um, yeah. attending this uh, conference next week. Can you talk to us about how um, African media workers and activists, like the, the ones that's going to attend, um, emphasize and have uh, pushed for the importance of access to information mm. laws and to improve the public debate? I think actually media activists and um, human rights advocates in Africa can be very, very proud of themselves. Because in the aftermath or at uh, the backdrop of the Windhoek Declaration, um, they formed the API, African Platform for Access to Information, and have been striving really <laughs> with very, very hardly and lots of work and enduringly and really going through a lot of issues, but and jointly, this is very important, jointly across um, the countries. Um, to, to see to it that uh, the 28th September is being recognized internationally as the Right to Information Day. And they succeeded. Um, in 2021, um, finally, we've celebrated the very first, you know, UN declared um, uh, UDA, un um, Universal Day of Access to Information. Um, and this is a great achievement in itself, because of course any of these celebrations, they shape the discourse, uh, they contribute to the realization of how important that right is. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know about this right. So you really yes. need to do a lot of, you know, marketing around that Thank even. You, and you. even in this regard, it was a success story. But um, I think we can call it Africa's gift to the world mm -hmm. in this regard. And um, these, these groups they have been doing a wonderful, great job. 
Actually, one of our sessions is dedicated to that, yes. to that history, to this story. It will be told. We call it a campfire chat. And uh, I'm sure we will all enjoy that. So um, in conclusion, why is it important we, we keep talking about having these access to information laws? Mm. Why is it important for countries to institutionalize access to information and to even um, uh, um, push for a mutual understanding uh, of these laws? Yes. First of all, I think um, without a legal framework, you, you can't really claim that right. Uh, so um, even though it might be enshrined in your constitution, um, you need legal frameworks to really operationalize that. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the very first step and it's necessary. And I think for all democratic forces, uh, you know, sometimes we, we have this understanding of um, antagonistic fights between government and the civil society. But actually, this is a misperception. At the end of the day, we all strive jointly together to achieve democracy. Democracy is about difference. We have to accept difference. We have to make use of it. It's a huge asset in itself. And um, it is within really um, the interest of each and every democratic government, as it is within the interest of each civil society group to strive and make sure that access to information is in place because access to public goods, human rights, democracy, they matter to all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining us and good luck with the conference, Raya. Thank you so much, Njimama, for having me. Okay. Thank you for tuning in. Now until next time, have a good evening.